Uh, hi, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar Tooling for Enterprise Kubernetes, uh, where we'll look at some of the more popular tools in both the enterprise and the Kubernetes space. My name is Saad Malik, and I'll be the host for the webinar. Uh, joining me are two key guest speakers, Sebastian Morissetti, who is the architect at Intech Financial, and then Gonzalo Maldonado, who is the chief technical advisor for Akeba. Uh, maybe Sebastian and Gonzalo, it'd be great if you could share some words about yourselves. Yeah, so Sebastian Morissette, I've been uh, working at Intac Financial for over 20 years. I've been concentrating in infrastructure for almost 18 of those. And uh, in the recent uh, couple of past years, concentrating mostly on DevOps and infrastructure as code. Hi, I'm Gonzalo Maldonado. Uh, I'm in working in different areas of infrastructure for the last 15 years. Um, I started working on Kubernetes and at one point even contributing about five years ago. And ever since I've been doing consulting with Akeva to help other companies adopt Kubernetes and cool, cool tools, honestly. Cool, awesome. So talking about cool tools. So some of the technologies that we'll be talking today about cover in the areas of automation, security, serverless, and also dev tools. Um, the tools that we're going to be showing here obviously are just a subset of the hundreds and thousands of tools that exist in the enterprise and Kubernetes space. Uh, but these are some of the ones that we found more interesting and we're seeing very popular. Uh, so to begin with, we'll cover the automation aspect and what does automation bring to the enterprises? So maybe Sebastian, you can kind of cover a little bit about automation and how do you guys use it today? Yeah, uh, well, automation is actually, like I said earlier, kind of a recent endeavor. Uh, most of the different teams had developed some sort of tribal knowledge around scripting for more than the past couple of years. But, you know, really talking about doing operations almost as a developer really came with the advent of DevOps in the most recent years. So, you know, a lot of the things that we had to go through was trying to shift towards that mindset. Because as an organization that's been doing operations and software engineering for many several years, uh, it does take a little bit of a mind shift to be able to get to these things. So DevOps is, you know, agile applied beyond the software team. So we had initial work done at Intact on the agile platform, but there's more to agile than just Scrum as I have on this slide right here, right? But operations tend to be volatile. And so we had to decide on which strategy we would adopt to be able to kind of bridge the gaps between just pure Agile and Scrum. So we went to more, more of a Kanban approach in the different uh, work areas that we have transferred to DevOps. But in a way, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done on top of DevOps as well. It's not just continuous delivery of infrastructure. So the key elements here is really to say that it's almost an osmosis between your dev and your ops teams where you actually have ops that start to think and use the same tools as your developers. And then also devs that have to sink a little bit deeper into infrastructure and really, uh, you know, start wearing pagers too. Like infrastructure folks, I see Gonzalo nodding, you know, we've had pagers for like ever in ops. We don't have pagers today, but the idea, it, it's an image, right? It's to tell you you're also on call because you're part of a single team that manages the whole thing. So that's just the process, right? But then afterwards, you have to get the people into the process and the people using the proper tools at the same time. Some of the shift that we have done, and that's why you know I, I wrote to Sebastian Amira on, on the attendee list earlier, like he started with us back a couple of years ago of working on Ansible and deploying at Intact some of our first initiatives of doing the DevOps. And we decided to adopt Ansible really as our automation tool at that time. And, you know, what we have are control nodes running off of Ubuntu. And as of today, we're able to orchestrate pretty much any flavor of an OVA, OVF, or, you know, Windows, and even uh, any flavor of Linux that you, you would think of. So we've went a long way from just deploying initial VMs to being able to support the broad requirements of our whole organization, which is very interesting. But the Ansible tool has a lot of pre-built code, which is really interesting. You really need to have that in order to be able to be efficient. You have to, if you have to write everything yourself, it's, it's gonna be a longer and a harder endeavor. So reusing some of the things that are there. We've also played a little bit with Terraform 
for some other work uh, workloads and work cases uh, use cases recently. So uh, automation, you need to choose a tool and then train your staff. Make sure that people are fluent in that in that area. When I was saying that ops need to think like devs, then you have to stop having repos of scripts everywhere that are just disks on a server. So we've started to have to use Git, uh, GitHub, GitLab, whatever flavor you would want, but just some sort of a software uh, distributed versioning system. Um, it's really what we're using today, right? The idea is to have your version control of your automation scripts, make sure that you're doing composable and reusable code. So not necessarily creating like huge functions, but small reusable pieces of code, which is very similar side to, you know, software engineering paradigms that you've been more used to working in, in your years as a software developer, right? And so the, the interesting part also is, like I said earlier, if the code exists, just use it and contribute back, make it better if you find bugs or anything, but avoid rebuilding stuff. It's not a race for IP, right? It's, it's really a question of being efficient and being able to use. You can build your own IP internally with what you do with the shared or the open source code, but it's really a point of not wasting cycles or time on doing stuff that's already out there and functioning. The last part I'd say that was really important was to do the shift towards a more programmable infrastructure. Um, it's become, it's became mandatory at Intact to choose infrastructure, choose components that are, you know, API first architected. If you can't program the infrastructure, your automation is going to reach a certain part where you have to make magic. It's, it's not just, it's not feasible. It's not sustainable. So in this particular mindset, looking at consuming or programming your infrastructure is a must. And so I've listed a couple of items here. This is not an exhaustive, an exhaustive lift, but you need to be able to use APIs or orchestrate or program your hypervisor, your network, right? Depending on your hypervisor, if it's in the cloud, private or public, or just a private environment, you need to be able to operate and deploy all of these things. And at Intact, we've pretty much nailed these elements that we have here. One of the interesting latest additions that we had in the past year and a half or so was even to start looking at things like emitting certificate with HashiCorp Vault. Another one of our colleagues has helped us put that into place and it's becoming operationalized internally, secret management at the same time. So as we move further from the actual base components of infrastructure, we're moving into more complex services uh, like I've mentioned here. So, so sub, just curious, like in in tax environment, and obviously you guys are looking to automating all the different components. And one principle you mentioned, dry, don't repeat yourself, right? Instead of having every single team essentially build their own set of scripts that are very similar, why can't we make a reusable library that potentially everywhere else in the organization that you're able to use? Um, if though, I mean, at the same time, you guys also have a DevOps approach where each team is it kind of uh, is on its own. They are, have their own capabilities to look at their own toolings. Some teams you may choose to use Ansible, other teams may choose to use Terraform. Like how do you make the way the balance between letting each team kind of have their own tooling versus building this reusable set of libraries that you can share across the organization? Well, the first thing is uh, we have a tenant approach. So we, we whenever someone wants to have a piece of the software defined data center, right? So a place where they can work, they get a tenant and the tenant is pre-published with a set of Ansible servers and we automatically clone the Git repo of our shared components. Afterwards, they have access to that, right? But if, if a module doesn't exist, they can go to the enterprise GitHub of IFC and they could build their own code. And then they could actually submit it back to the whole community if they want to. So to give you an example, one of the teams at Intact that has started working on this uh, in a recent project that I'm working on uh, has built a role to allow us to automate the installation of a multi-site uh, distributed database. So as this is maturing, they're starting to consider contributing this back to the 
shared repo so that other teams can start consuming the service as well. So it needs to be a kind of a back and forth. It's not just one core team providing the same way as the open source community uh, you know, that we can use, right? It's not just one way street where everybody's getting, but nobody's contributing. We're starting to see that shift. Teams internally are starting to contribute stuff that benefits the whole, right? So it, I think it's more of a mantra, uh, Saad, where at some point people are seeing the value in it and they really decide to adopt. So it's really going from that tribal knowledge of operators that have their own little stash of scripts and knowledge that they hold on to dearly yeah. to sharing the stuff and being aware that, okay, instead of hard coding information into the script, parameterize it, externalize stuff, make sure it's reusable. And that's why that whole paradigm of ops starting to think like devs, like how many years has it been that developers are making functions, making sure they can reuse them and making sure that they're building libraries instead of repeating code. But that's slowly getting to creep into ops as well now that they yeah. have the tools and the tooling to do that. And it's interesting because, you know, we're using Unix machines, right? <laughs> like Linux is a Unix nowadays, completely indistinguishable. And yeah, the philosophy of this uh, core architecture is like, hey, we want composable commands. We want to be able to pipe one command into another and reuse those commands in different contexts, right? Like that's how this whole ecosystem was built. And it's kind of interesting that we needed containers to go back into this uh, philosophy, right? Like we don't want to go into the specifics of like, hey, here's the magic incantation for getting a database. It should be simple. It should be Helm install Postgres and that's it. And it's great that we're going back into those uh, fundamentals and really thinking, again, like you were saying, DRI, right? right? So like, we want that. We want to be able to say like, hey, if we have this scenario where like, hey, you need a database and you need to plug into something, that should be an easy recipe. We can just copy it for multiple clients, right? Internal or external. So this is really exciting. It's really exciting to see that our tools are getting so much more, so much better because they were getting in the way for many, many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that consistent way of installing and managing and these operators and controller patterns, specifically in Kubernetes, is helping that. I mean, you can just see the innovation is increasing at a rapid speed because the way we're able to consume these tools is a lot easier. The way we get updates to these tools is a lot easier. Before, you'd have to compile things from source code and build a lot of it yourself. That's yeah. completely changed now, right? A small set of team of engineers can build something that 10 years ago would have taken hundreds of engineers to do. But imagine how far side we had to go to make sure that hardware or infrastructure becomes just a commodity that doesn't have an impact or an incidence that much on what you put on top of it. So the application centricity of everything that comes with Kubernetes and simplifying and more concentrating on the workloads than actually the setup itself, being able to apply policies instead of just static configurations so that it's adaptive to what environment or area it's being deployed. All of these things are making it different to do ops and infrastructure. I mean, we've had significant changes that we had to do uh, in the past couple of years to adopt this and it's not finished. But once you've started going down that lane, you see synergies with other groups, other teams and people adopt it and slowly, you know, the ball gets rolling. Yeah. So Sebastian, you covered Git a little bit. I mean, are you guys also exploring this new term GitOps at all with an intact and Gazala? Do you guys? Yeah, at Intact, uh, we have different teams for tooling, and they are they are always on the lookout to try to build new ways of making us more efficient. Right. Uh, for those of you who know Intact, we're a company that grows by acquisition. So we have also the opportunity to learn from a lot of new uh, employees or staff that comes into the organization. So it gives us an opportunity to see how different people across different parts of the globe are actually working with tool sets and everything. So definitely the, the GitOps, we have teams internally that are looking into these things. I mentioned HashiCorp Vault earlier, right before the PKI process of actually getting specific certificates was a very manual and lengthy process. Now we're able to issue certificates on the fly and stuff like that. So it's really reinventing every part of your operations to get away from mundane tasks. So yeah, the new approaches, we're always on the lookout for them. But as a production company with the, the volume and the revenue we have, 
we have to be cautious. We can't get tangled up into too many ventures or too many risks, right? It needs to be a little bit solid. So we're on the lookout for them, but at the same time, it needs to be at a certain level of maturity so that it actually doesn't cause more problems and addresses more solutions instead. So it's a fine balance. It's a juggling act, to be honest. Yeah, and going to a question uh, that the audience uh, made, DC automation, you know, there's so many ways to do it, but the ways we usually see when it's gone correctly is when you can actually repeat it, right? When you can actually say like, hey, it's not a one-off, it, it's not like magic that I was able to lift this cluster up. When you can be able to say like, hey, I can do it a hundred times, like that's the maturity level that you want to achieve. And again, that, that's where it's the, your usage of your tools and how you use them like really shines. Like GitOps is a great way of achieving some of this re repeatability. It's like, hey, I already have a way to do this recipe. Literally, I'm going to just git pull and copy it in a new repository. That's kind of the expertise that we want to achieve at most of our for most of our clients. Like just say like, hey, if you have a new team, they can just go and git clone what the other team did and you're good to go. And it takes a little bit of work, but it's becoming so much easier every day. And that's something that gets us really excited. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Gonzalo, because if you think about it, for developers and DevOps, I mean, you're already using tools like Git and PR requests day in and day out. You're just leveraging the same tools, not only for development, but deployment. And along with that, you get the whole aspect of traceability, right? Who made what change? Why did it do it? The whole aspect of peer review processing. You know, if I'm an engineer making a change into a cluster, my boss, you know, maybe Sebastian has to approve it saying, yes, SOD's okay, this is allowed, or we can't do it because you need additional budgeting or whatever the process may be. So it brings all those capabilities right into the same development process you're already used to. And I think that's huge. And it even has even lower level or, or, uh, implications. To give you one of the example of the discussions that we're having at IFC, once you can do like Gonzalo was saying, right, repeat a thousand times with the same result, a deployment of a configuration for a runtime environment or something for your app to run on, it changes your, uh, your, you know, requirements from a backup perspective. Do you still need to backup machines that have only config? You still want to backup your data, but the machines that only have configuration for runtime you can replay whenever you want. So it changes the whole approach to traditional operations in a way based on, I don't need, it's gonna be longer to restore from tape or restore from object storage or whatever that particular VM than actually rebuild it. So that, that whole, it, it deeply changes your approach in many of the traditional operations. So you start just wanting to automate, but as you get more mature, you see how much ramifications you can actually go and change more profoundly into your whole ops, which creates the synergies I was referring to earlier. Yeah, very cool. Cool, Thea, thanks, Seb. So uh, maybe Gonzalo, I think you want to show some of those cool tools that you've been working out, right? So. Yeah, um, yeah, before that, uh, I just want to touch uh, a little bit about um, Bolt. Uh, you mentioned Sebastian, and yeah, for us, that has been one of the tools that we tend to start with when, when we have a new client that wants to go over Kubernetes. Um, Walt is an amazing tool to just say like, hey, here's where all my secrets and credentials, like we're dealing with enterprise, right? Like having access control, having role-based accounts, like that's a reality. Like different um, people in your company are going to have different accesses. So if you start with Vault, it, it's a great way to just like get it out of the way. Like say like, hey, we're going to store it here. And in recent years, like the integration with Kubernetes has been so seamless. Like nowadays, so easy to just configure Kubernetes to access the secrets from Vault. So you can go and lift a new application really quickly and like, oh, your secrets are already here. So basically just turns, you just need to up change your load balancer to say like, hey, here's a new cluster and that's it. Like all the secrets were already there, everything was ready to go. So that's one of the tools that um, I frequently use with other customers. And, um, and I think, yeah, like you said, specifically Red Vault, right? I mean, the number of integrations that Kubernetes has into Vault, it's not just about getting the KV values out. You know, I want to get my secret for my, my load balancer. They even have capabilities for generating certificates automatically. So one of the integrations we did for a client is where you have Cert Manager that is automatically generating short-lived certificates for 30 days. 
based on the ingress support. You don't have to go into as an operator, add any specific rules, you know, talk to this wall, specify these configuration. Everything is done via the ingress resource. Our certificate is generated. When it gets to the 85% of the longevity of the certificate, it automatically regenerates a new one, right? And just makes a seamless experience for everybody's involved. That, yeah, that's another that's another interesting point because that means from an operational perspective, when you needed to track certificates before, now you set and forget, right? Because it, it's just taken care of for you. So it's other value that you can generate. The people that were staffed to track those certificates can now actually do other tasks. So you're doing more than you were doing before because some of these tasks you can just forget about them. Yeah, and it's so seamless. Like literally, Kubernetes handles for you. Like every deploy, you can set it up so the tenancy gets rotated. So yeah, your operators get so much more time. Like I have many fires where so many pages when it's like, oh, the certificate expires tomorrow, and we you need to call, you know, the vendor and like, hey, give us a key quickly because it's about to expire and stuff like that. Once you're involved, you just forget about those issues for the most part, which is great. Like, it's great. yeah, it's definitely a game changer. Awesome. Uh, about other tools that I've been uh, using on with our deployments, um, the one I, I want to talk about is called Teresa. And the reason I bring it up is many of our customers come from, from companies that have been using Heroku for a while. And Heroku is great. Like I think that that was another paradigm shift that happened um, almost a decade ago, but it was great. Like it really showed people how having a 12 factor app, you know. Using environment variables for deployments, more new configuration to the same place, and stuff like that. It really speed up our development teams. Like the moment the dev side of things start making things cleaner and more repeatable, operations just start going like crazy. So it's natural that we want to move, you know, from that world into the Kubernetes world. So um, I found this tool called Teresa uh, by Rusa Labs. And it's great. Like you basically can just recycle uh, the, the proc files that you had for uh, Heroku. Mm. And the other reason I really like highlighting this tool is because it kind of shows you that having the Kubernetes API allows you to do things like this, like you're creating a platform on top of Kubernetes. And most people wouldn't know that they're actually using Kubernetes. They would think like, oh, this is the same as I was doing before. Like, oh, I didn't have to change anything. In reality, everything changed, but Having this very flexible APIs allows you to interact very differently with your with, with your developer teams. Like you don't have to, you know, it will be great if they know how to use Kubernetes and how to use kubectl and all this uh, tooling, but they don't have to. You can create scenes to make it whatever experience you want to uh, have. Like going back to the conversation about GitOps, you can create a complete Git-driven uh, interface to Kubernetes, just saying like Git push and Git deployed. That's kind of the things that you can achieve with Kubernetes that are kind of hard with other um, frameworks. Like you don't get the that level of flexibility on the API. You don't get that opportunity to really build whatever you want in this middle layer. Uh, Sebastian, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it comes back to that aspect that all these tooling, because they're all based on the like, Kubernetes API, you can build all these platforms on top of that, right? The same tooling that I'll be showing in the later in the demo with K9S on how you interact with Kubernetes clusters, I guarantee you the CRDs that Teresa creates and being able to create your builds, manifest, your past manifest, all those capabilities you can manage through K9S. You can back it up using your Valero tool. It's all because of the ecosystem they're all plugged inside of. And, and that aspect of building on top of each other is how we're able to have innovation that moves so quickly. Yeah, and, and it also adds to seeing how there's different me there's many different ways to approach resolving a single problem or a single operational re reality. So, like Saad, you talked about K9S. Gonzalo, you're talking uh, about Teresa. A lot of people will have learned the cube cuddle way, right? Directly using it. So, there's so many approaches to this that in the end, it just shows how the community can actually add on top and continue generating value and that you can pretty much find. So back to the point I was making earlier, right? You found a way, Gonzalo, to use something that was already there to increase the value to your customers. So same thing, you didn't go out and say, you know what, I'm gonna code something or I'm gonna invent something new because it was already there. On the other hand, 
when something is in there, that's when you can generate new value by creating a new functionality or, or way of producing it, right? So it's, it, there's, there's so many ways to get things done that this is an interesting tool to actually lay on top of your Kubernetes. That's what I find interesting. Yeah, and let me do a super quick demo of another tool that I think is a great example of this flexibility that we have now to create platforms of, of Kubernetes. So the, the tool I'm going to show now is called QoS, and it basically allows you to create uh, functions as a service uh, kind, of, kind of a paradigm. So let me show you. Um, here I have this... Um, this really small script It's a Python script and it basically just goes and prints uh, whatever I send to it. It's like a very straightforward function, just basically hello world. But the cool thing about this is that once we did use uh, QoS, we get the opportunity to turn it into a function. Um, we get the opportunity to say like, hey, I want this script that I made to turn into something that it's running Kubernetes and it's ready to get this um, this call. And as you can see, this is just a function. We're literally just saying like, hey, go and say hello, that's it. We're not creating a whole application. We are not creating a whole deployment. We're creating a function. And then for operators, G just literally have to say like, hey, QLS, go and, uh, and call it. Like, uh, here's the name of the function. Here's the parameters they're gonna uh, send, and that's it. Like, there is really no, you don't need to think about servers or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you just go and I'm bad at talking and I'm typing the same thing. <laughs> and, uh, um, you have to say like, hey, this function is available for you, go and play with it. And that's great. That creates such a great abstraction for developers. They are like, okay, I can just focus on the business need that I have. I just need to go and focus on like, hey, I want to get some data. I want to uh, get it out in a report. I'm going to the function about it, that's it. They don't need to think about like, hey, where am I running this? How many resources do I need? How many bots? Like, that is completely abstracted out from, from them, which I think really shows the power of this. It really, should, you know, you can, you can give flexibility. Like some teams will just want to be like, buy and forget, completely black box. They don't want to like, you know, they just want to run their code, right? Or teams like they need a little more details. They're like, hey, how many computes units do I need? How much money is this gonna cost me? But for the most part, like this, you control that narrative versus in the old tools where you had to spend so much time like showing also the developers how to operate things, right? Like it was the ops dev instead of DevOps, right? It was like, hey, first go and learn how to use this database. First go and read this whole manual before you can actually build your thing, right? And here we're flipping to the logical narrative, like, just but Gonzalo, just just a quick question. Mm -hmm. So this is actually enabling your own flavor, if you want to, in your Kubernetes cluster of an equivalent of AWS Lambda function or serverless, right? So yes. in the end, you're getting that scalability and management that Kubernetes gives you, but you're also being able to provide that function as a service uh, internally for your apps. So that's an interesting... Uh, I'm going to want to play with that. Yeah, and it's great yeah. because, uh, again, you have your Kubernetes cluster and you can you have multiple options of doing this, right? Like you can say to your customers, let's go uh, serverless. I mean, yes, you're doing your Kubernetes, but it's serverless for them. Or you can go with a traditional deployment where, hey, you need to go and create like your home recipe and go out. So it's a great, like, um, you know, more options is always better. and. But back to the point I was saying earlier about ops having these huge libraries of Python code or scripts or anything, you can almost put a web front end with this call to just running any script that you'd want. So that's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's one or one of the um, open source packages that uh, Kubeless has. Uh, they look at a UI that you can just get ball and play around with it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to lift it up today, but. Yeah, it's out there. Uh, keep less alive, I think it's gone. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I mean, as a developer experience, you, you nailed it. You don't have to learn the infrastructure portion. You don't have to know about the pod and service and secrets. I mean, this abstraction, specifically if you use a serverless packages, you're able to deploy into Lambda, you can deploy to Knative, you can deploy to Kubeless. 
all that is out of the box. And because it's running on top of Kubernetes, you get all of the power of Kubernetes behind it as well. Things like the resiliency, if one of your nodes crashes, right, Kubernetes with the auto scalers, with those resiliency capabilities will launch a new node. All the pods, all the services that need to be running, they'll be automatically relaunched. If you start having a peak hours, you have your Thanksgiving or something, you start getting lots of traffic into your Kubernetes clusters, Kubeless and its frameworks will automatically scale up your number of pods so that you don't have to know, wake up at three in the morning and do some operations to get it up and running. I mean, these are self-resilient auto-healing platforms. And I think the power of Kubernetes enables these tools to be a lot faster and so they don't have to build these capabilities themselves as well. Yeah. The only part I don't agree with you though is saying that you don't need to know. People should always know because you <laughs> need to understand how it works. But you know, in the end, it's it's just a question of how much you need to know about it, right? And that's where the team comes in, that osmosis between dev and ops, right? The dev needs to need to know at least a little to understand how a choice he makes will impact the ops team. Because in the context of trying to build a multifunctional team in DevOps, uh, I feel that developers that didn't know how the ops work was where we were 10, 15 years ago. And, and that was like the dark ages because they just throw a package over the fence and say, you ops handle it. And that wasn't necessarily the best outcome for any sort of business, right? So I feel there needs to be much, much more proximity between not necessarily mastering the technology, but at least knowing how it works, knowing how it functions and understanding how a choice you make as a developer will potentially ruin the weekend of your operator and your team. And so understand that you might be called in to fix it too. Yeah, no, I think you always need some level of expertise in the team. I think the difference from my perspective is if you think about deploying Kubernetes, and imagine you're doing it yourself completely. If you're doing it yourself, you would need to have 10 rock solid DevOps and ops people that know the ins and outs of how to do certificate management in Kubernetes, how do you set up your etcd, how do you do backup, how do you restore. There are platforms out there, you know, whether it's managed Kubernetes solutions or vendors like Spectre Cloud, that kind of automate 80, 90% of that work for you. You still need that one or two guys in your 10-man team that knows the ins and outs of Kubernetes. You do, because there's always going to be going to be some issue you have to debug. But you don't need everyone on the team to be an expert at it. And I think oh, yeah, that, sure. that, You're shifting your knowledge towards what brings value to your business, not to understanding something that someone has learned how to play the tune for you already, right? Exactly. Cool. Um, so I guess... My turn, the tools that I would like to show are first one with authentication called kubelog. Give me one second, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Just a two. So I have a little bit of slides, but I'll, I think the more fun is gonna be the actual, the demo aspect. So you guys all know that obviously security and authentication is key uh, in, in a platform like Kubernetes. Kubernetes does provide a number of different options, you know, from PKI-based certificates, front-end proxy, OpenID Connect, and a bunch of others. And the one that most people are commonly used, the one that is most um, it, people are already have out of the box, is a PKI-based certificate. These are generally true for package solutions like OpenShift or KubeADM or COPS that provision a certificate that essentially gives you your system master's capability. You have cluster admin privileges in the cluster. The challenge comes that as you, your team starts scaling to more number of engineers, as you start adding additional roles and permission, how do you maintain these certificates that you're generating for Kubernetes? Um, as of right now, at least for the, the Vault does not have a specific integration for managing certificates for authentication in the Kubernetes. But there are a bunch of tools that Kubernetes does provide, you know, using CSRs, you're able to provide tools um, using uh, tools like Permission Manager on top of that. But these becomes a little bit burdensome to maintain and manage over time. So the way most organizations would like to manage their authentication and their authorization is already that integrates with their identity provider. So most organizations today have tools like an Okta or ADFS or Azure Admin to be able to provide authentication permissions for different users. What, what the demo that I'm going to show you is a tool called Kube Login. 
that makes it really simple for developers and operators who are using Kubernetes to not have to learn yet another tool. The commands that do today, like I want to be, be able to run a kubectl get pod, have a tool like this kube login that automatically connects to your IDP, whether it's Okta, ADFS, or whatever, generate a token for you. That token is generated, it gives back to this kube login tool, and is transparently sent to kubectl so that you're able to communicate with the API server. The demo that I have, we're gonna have three different groups sitting inside of Okta. You have a team one admin, a team one editor, and a team one viewer. Um, and I'm gonna show you that as a team one viewer, you know, this yellow guy over here, I'm gonna be able to do commands like kubectl get pods. But if I try making a modify operation in my namespace, like if I try to create a new pod, it's gonna fail until I move this user into the admin level group. So give me one second, so let me share my entire desktop again. While, while you're doing that, Sad, you have no clue how, how different vendors struggle to get this basic RBAC functionality provided. Like you've got some major vendors sometimes where you get into the RBAC model and it's deficient in so many ways, but it's so important to enterprises because with the sheer size of a company, let's say like intact different roles and everything, you need to be able to give an auditor his specific access, an admin, a viewer and stuff. So it really is important once scale becomes significant for a company. So these are key enterprise uh, features that are required. Yeah, absolutely. So um, on this terminal here, I have a GCP Picard 2 user. If I take a look at the kube config, um, you'll notice that internally the user itself is an OIDC user that is gonna be authenticating uh, with my Okta. The cool thing about this kube config is it's not specific to a user. I can pass the exact same kube config to Gonzalo, to Sebastian, anybody else in our team, in our organization. Okta is the one that's gonna be providing what level of access you have into each of these clusters. And it becomes even more important as you have multiple clusters, you don't have to maintain different permissions in each and every single cluster. And an interesting thing, Saad, also, is that since this is federated authentication, you decide on Okta what are your identity sources. So on top of that, we can all use the same one, but then afterwards, depending on how you evolve, if you have you know consultants coming in or whatever, you can federate towards different other LDAPs and or other SAML-based IDPs. So there's that model of federating authentication, which simplifies the whole flow. You externalize it completely. Absolutely. So here, uh, if I go into directory, if I look at my groups, uh, notice that I have a team one admin, edit and view, and like Sebastian said, right, they also have capabilities for directory integrations. I might have LDAPs or ADFS and other tooling behind the scenes as my source, but to the endpoint for OpenID Connect, it's always gonna be, this is your Okta endpoint here. If I look at my team one view group, you'll notice that I have a number of users, including myself, and if I switch back to my terminal view here and I run a command, actually, I'm gonna first log out of here. So you'll see the entire end-to-end -end workflow. I think one key important point here is you don't have to learn yet another tool as a developer. As a developer, all I'm gonna run is a command like, hey, get me my actual pods in my default namespace. I hit enter. And what it's gonna do is it's actually gonna bring up my Okta web page for me because I signed out, I'm obviously asked to sign in again. I click on sign in and it'll say, yep, you're already authenticated into the cluster. Switch back to my terminal. Notice that I get an error that the user saw it, does not have access to list the pods in the default namespace. But if I change this to team one, right, voila, I'm able to see my two different pods running in this namespace. For the next aspect of the demo, I'm gonna try making a modification. I'm gonna go ahead and make a new pod called hello3 instead of the team one namespace. If I click on enter, you should get an error saying the user saw does not have capabilities to modify anything in, in namespace team one. Switch back to Okta as an admin level user, right? I'll log in. Okay. I will log in, I will go into my groups and then I will in the team one admin view, I will manage people and I'm gonna go ahead and add sod and then click on save. So one cool thing that this kube login tool does behind the scene 
is it caches the actual token for you so it doesn't keep retrieving it. Uh, it only caches it for one hour. I can force it to delete the cache, right? And then I'll run the exact same command again, kubectl run the pod number three. And now it's going to authenticate with Okta again. And this time, the pod is created. So having that single source of truth for both your auditing, for your authentication, for your authorization, be your identity provider that all enterprises already use, I think is a huge plus point. And this tool that Kubelogin that I use makes it just really easy for developers to be able to not have to learn yet another tool. It just works seamlessly with the processes we already have. Uh, Gonzalo, uh, have you guys, uh, what do you guys use today for most of your clients, like when they're connecting with OpenID Connect? Um, depends a little bit on what they're using. Uh, many of our clients, you know, they just want to use what they already set up for AWS, like okay, AM roles. They just want to roll with them again. But we're seeing that, crucially enough, most of them, they already have uh, an SSO provider, a SAML provider. So, Personally, I think this is definitely the route to go. And this gives more flexibility because, again, you're an enterprise, right? Like, you want to tie everything together. You want to, like, hey, you're hiring, be tied to your permissions, be tied to your uh, access, right? Like, the more you can do that, the faster you can go and just say, like, hey, this person is new. They got an email. They're good to go, right? They have access to all these two things. So, so yeah, I personally think, like, this is the direction that I, I'm wanting more, more for customers to go into. Like, just say, like, hey. Your source of truth, again, it's not a whole idea behind like what matters is the business, right? So how can we provide the, the people that are on their teams to do the work that they want to do? Yep. Yeah, and, and there there are some potential roadblocks for sizable companies, though. Like uh, uh, at IFC, we're working on privilege access management concepts and putting in, you know, a privilege access manager and also jump point access to kind of funnel access towards either a VDI environment or something for privileged access. And so the fact that your console right now is running off of your Mac side and that it could actually have access to open a browser in all the same user context and allow you to get all that cycle done in a more air-gapped environment or secured environment, that means that that particular target area where you're actually running through some sort of screen uh, uh, propagation like VDI, Citrix, or whatever, would need to allow you to run that cycle in that environment. So you need to be able to have it run in that closed loop to be able to achieve the same results. So it's not necessarily, depending on the company, as straightforward as we've seen here. But the important thing for, for the attendees is to see that it exists. And based on proper configuration and work inside your organization, you're going to be able to achieve this level of RBAC inside of your Kubernetes environments and workloads, which is an enterprise level feature. All right, guys. So the next demo I want to show you guys is K9S. I mean, this is one of the tools that I've always raved about from the beginning when I started Kubernetes. Kubernetes itself, as you guys know, is a complex platform. There are many different resources that Kubernetes have from deployments and replica sets and pods and PVCs and secrets and, and you name it. And it takes a little bit of getting used to, you know, being able to understand what each of these resources do and then being able to use troubleshooting on it. Uh, well, one example I'll say is like, okay, one common use case is, okay, I have a secret. I need to actually get the token out of that secret. It might be a service account. How do I do that? So you might do something like, okay, let me go ahead and run, let me switch to my admin view. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, go ahead and show me all of my secret in all of my namespaces, all right? This will take a second to run. Okay, so here I have this vault token secret. Okay, if I wanna get the actual token out of it, or I'll have to do some kind of arcane command, kubectl, get secret in the vault namespace, right? Go ahead and get this one out. If I take a look at it, as you do a dash yo YAML, this has a dot token. Okay, now I have to remember the syntax. This is going to be JSON path equals to something like dot data dot token, right, inside of parentheses here. And this, if I do everything right, right, should get me the token out. This token is also base64 encoded. Okay, now I have to remember to do base64 to code it and then be able to retrieve it out. This is just one example of a common operation many of us do on a daily basis. 
The other one says, I want to be able to look at logs for my Nginx pods. Obviously, I'll start off with, okay, let me go ahead and list all of my actual pods and my all my namespaces that start with Nginx. Then I have to remember to copy this entire string, then do a kubectl logs, write with dash n, pass that here, and then I have to look for the exact string that I'm looking for. It's Obviously, I think, uh, Sebastian, you covered this. You have to know the internals of what it's doing. But when you're doing this day in, day out, it becomes a little bit tedious. And most people, right, they build small little shortcuts that say, hey, in kubectl, get me the pods in my namespace, you know, default. And, and obviously, these things become really helpful when you're doing something repetitive over and over and over again. But if you don't know which seeker you want to retrieve, you can't obviously build these aliases. There is a really powerful tool that I like to use called K9S. You can think of it like kubectl on steroids. It's a terminal UI visualization tool that is able to list all the different resources running in the Kubernetes clusters across all namespaces. So in this view, I'm looking at all my pods across all namespaces. If I want to limit it to a specific namespace, I can say, hey, go to the namespace view and look for my Nginx, right? Voila, now I'm just looking at the pods running specifically inside of my Nginx namespace. I can go into this one here, and this is a container running here. I press the letter L, and now I'm tailing the logs, live logging on the specific pod. If I'm looking for a specific error message or a specific string, I can say, hey, search directly in here for the string 309, and now filters all the other stuff out of it. Yes, you know, learning K9S does require a little bit of, you know, your shortcuts and keyboards and understanding of the commands it does. But day to day, as you become more familiar with this tool, you're able to do a lot of different cool capabilities. Um, the secret example that we just did, let's do that again. So let's look for all secrets. I can say, hey, show me all secrets across all namespaces. Uh, actually, let me just limit it to maybe the my vault namespace. And now show me all the secrets running in here. This is the vault token. I press one letter, the letter X, and it shows me the exact same token. If I press the letter C, it copies it to my clipboard, <laughs> right? You can see how easy a tool like K9S makes it to be able to manage, administer, and observe my entire cluster. Uh, some of the other really cool things that they built into K9S is this concept called Pulse, where if I'm gonna just look at how's my cluster doing? You know, how many deployments do I have? How many replica sets? How many stateful sets? This is like a poor man's version of Datadog monitoring where I'm able to be able to have this on a, on a whiteboard or on a wall and see how my cluster is doing. Um, logging, pulsing, security audits, all of these things are built into this tool, Keenan S. Um, so you mentioned about not all tooling is available. You know, you don't have direct access to the cluster because you need to maybe jump in through a jump box. But wherever you jump into, most likely you will have access to a terminal. As long as you're able to install a brew install command or yum install um, K9S, you don't need a browser. You directly are interfacing with this tool to the Kubernetes clusters. Anywhere else yeah, you have which is, which is the Which is the added value to a tool like this compared to Lens or other desktop-based tools that are fatter and need to have access to the cluster API or at least to your Kubernetes endpoints. So depending on your requirements, your needs, you still have the power of these tools that you can use. So that's an interesting interesting yeah. topic. And, and obviously this is more of a terminal-based editor, but there are other alternatives like you mentioned. Octant has one, there's one by Lens, there's Cuvius. There's a bunch of different tools to be able to administer and view depending on the different use cases you may have. So. Okay, um, and for the last thing, I'll just, I'm not gonna demo it, but I'm just gonna show you guys is Argo CD. So this comes back to the discussion about having, let me just flip this here to Argo CD. Let me flip this. So we talked about consistency and the whole aspect of GitOps. I mean, we talked about how GitOps is this new model, this new workflow for how not only development teams, but DevOps teams and operations teams are able to get the visibility into how and what applications and configurations are deployed into your cluster. Along with that, you get your traceability of what, when was something was made, who made the change, and the consistency as you're deploying across multiple different clusters. So the tool that I'm really beginning to like is called Argo CD. 
And what it does and where it fits in the pipeline is developers make go ahead and make changes to the source code. They'll run their CI pipeline, you know, whether it's GitLab or Jenkins or Concourse or whatever. Sorry. Uh, and then this goes ahead and pushes those Docker images into the registry. The same CI pipeline will also now publish different manifests for this application. It could be based on Helm chart. It could be based on static manifest. It could be customized. It could be anything that essentially Kubernetes takes. Traditionally, what an ops person would do is he would take these manifests and do a kubectl apply into Kubernetes cluster one, kubectl apply into Kubernetes cluster two, and you have to maintain the configurations in this local laptop or wherever as they're applying the Kubernetes commands. Argo CD is able to automate this piece. It's able to take all the manifests that you have already checked into a Git repository, whether it's Helm chart, static manifest, customizer, whatever, and then deploy it to your Kubernetes cluster. It's able to synchronize it. As soon as you have a new build for your dev cluster or your dev pipeline that has new manifests being pushed, Argo CD, you can configure it to automatically push this latest application changes to your cluster. The other really cool tool with Argo CD is an auto healing capability. If you accidentally go into your Kubernetes cluster and delete your namespace, we are able to specify an auto healing option here that will replace all those change configurations or deleted configurations directly in the cluster. Um, Argo CD does provide a, a push-based model where you might have a single Argo CD cluster that is able to push these applications and manifest to a number of different clusters. Uh, but they also support a pool-based model where you're able to have Argo CD running in each one of your workload clusters, and it pulls in the manifest configuration and the Helm chart configuration and applies it locally. Um, obviously, they have a CLI tool and a really fancy UI tool as well. So if you're doing anything in terms of maintaining a common set of configuration, deploying your applications on top of Kubernetes, highly recommend you guys to look at Argo CD. Have you guys used Argo CD or tools like this? Uh, I have yeah. a team at Intact that's looking into it. It's, uh, yeah, we use Argo CD for a couple of our customers, and they love it. Um, for one, the visibility that it brings, like we were talking earlier, that it's great when you can just do like a git pull and see what happens. Like Argo CD is one of those tools that allows you to have that experience, right? Just being able to like, hey, I'm going to push this uh, to a branch, and then you hop into Argo CD and you say like, okay, Here's the moment it's talking with Kubernetes. Here's the moment that it's doing those changes. It's great. And it's also great that you don't have to like explicitly jump into like a terminal to watch all this happen, right? Like, yeah, it's cool that you can, do, you know, uh, as an operator, use KNNS to see what's going on and get a this <laughs> broader picture. But for, for the end customer, they're like, hey, I just want to see what's going on with my PR, right? I'm like, the good old question Did I break something? I will see the answer to that. They're like, no, your build is green here and it's deployed. Break a leg. So, yeah, this is one of my favorites. Uh, to be honest, it also it also is kind of a transition. Like on that maturity scale, Gonzalo, you were talking about earlier, right? Most of our different CI/CD initiatives or anything in the past have started off on other tools, maybe Jenkins or other types of approaches. And this is kind of the next evolution of these types of tools that will actually more easily integrate natively with Kubernetes compared to having an add-on plug into an existing system you've had for several years that tries to tie in that functionality. So this is very declarative inside of Argo CD side. I think from the demo, it's not necessarily showing it as declarative as it is, but it's a very uh, declarative process. And it actually is tied into the new GitOps trend. So which is interesting because it's just a new spin on an existing concept of CI CD, but focused on uh, Kubernetes, which is interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so with that, I think we can open it up uh, for questions. If anybody has any, please go ahead and ask them in the Q&A section or just raise your hand. Uh, but any other tools, Gonzalo, Sebastian, um, that you guys are thinking about or interested in, that you see people starting to use in Kubernetes land? Hmm. Not not so much, well, tools, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, right? Or I think Gonzalo mentioned it. It's, it's difficult sometimes to 
give a ten- someone a tenant or an environment and then limit them in what they need to do. And that's pretty much an old traditional mindset of enterprise of trying to cap what people could do. Today, it's more a question of instead of making that a serial, like you have serial requests of having to get approved or something, you want them to prove something because by the time they get approvals on something or a new tool in the enterprise, Sometimes it would have been faster and they would have known within about a day or two that it's not going to meet their needs, but they had to go three weeks of process to getting approvals to just try it out. So depending on the size of your organization, it can be difficult to easily try to use new tools. I've seen that at Intact. People want to innovate. People want to do something, but the whole process around the whole thing traditionally in the past took a lot of time. Now the proofing is made a lot easier by giving them tenants. They can test things out, but you need to improve your processes. So it's not just a question of how getting access to the tools themselves, or how easy it is to get approvals sometimes. So a lot of what you guys have shown today, they're easy to test and to proof. Yeah. But then afterwards, depending on the size of your company, you're going to have to go through the procurement process or legal process of checking and looking at the different licenses, seeing if that license is okay with your legal department and stuff. So I'd say that at an intact, we're trying to uh, encourage people to try and to evolve into these new tools and try, but at the same time, you have to secure your existing revenue. So it's, it's, it's a transition. We're slowly getting there, but in all transparency, not all teams are properly equipped at this time with the apps that they're running to actually be able to leverage all of these tools. Because as a company that grows, like I said earlier, by acquisition, sometimes you inherit applications that aren't necessarily using an architecture paradigm that allows you to even start thinking of a Kubernetes or containerized deployment for that particular application. So investments need to be made and that's over time. So uh, it's very specific to more agile or more newer builds, new net new applications have a bigger potential of ending up on these things, I would say. Yeah, but one important point that uh, you touched on, Sebastian, is that being on Kubernetes allows you to play around. Again, like, as it should be, right? Like, hey, I want to try this on my local machine. I want to go and try this package on my Minikube or uh, a Docker-based uh, Kubernetes installation and then see if it works for me for not, or not. And then once you, I have that, like moving the transition into actual production, it's way easier. And yes, you still have to go through this whole process. And there are some ways that um, you need to enforce this uh, guidelines. You know, one thing that we have laid out on, with our customers, which is great, is we literally put them as steps on our uh, continuous del- delivery. Like, hey, if you want to deploy this package, um, you need an approval from someone else, right? And they just get a Slack message like, hey, Someone wants to lift this message. Are you sure it's clear with legal? And then legal can just say literally in Slack, like, yes, go ahead. That's great. Like, that's kind of the level that you need to go because, as you were saying, we need to be agile uh, on these enterprises. We need to move faster than our competitors. Like, that's always when, you know, a newcomer comes in and, like, they don't have all this overhead that most companies already have, right? Like, they don't have all these processes. So if these processes are are really slow, your company is not going to be iterating and moving fast. Yeah, if you want to keep your competitiveness, you need to be able to transform and to keep up with disruption and startups or anyone that would come into your space and literally challenge you on what you're already doing. So yeah, it it, it is definitely an area where uh, the different tools, Saad, like you asked, need to be looked into and teams are trying to do so. But again, it's all a question of balance, right? Do they have the time to actually, like, if I take off the IT hat and I look more at a management hat, do you allow your teams to have the time to play around like Gonzalo was saying? Do you grant them enough hours in a week or in a month to try individual or, or personal pet projects, let's say, of testing a new technology and stuff like that? Hmm. The innovation is not going to fall on you by accident. You know, It depends on how much leverage you give to your staff, how much time you give to your employees and to your collaborators to try these things out and actually be able. I've seen many different situations where someone is scared to give their employees access to the cloud because of their concern that it's going to overspend. 
but all the other value that they're getting back from what the person tests and uses as functionality, you're not getting either. So mm. there's, so I think that's the balancing act. And that's a little bit of that, you know, dance that you need to do is all of the tools we've presented today are interesting, but you need to allow your, your staff to be able to play with them, see the value and apply them in your environment. If you always wait for a requirement to then look for a tool, you might be missing something. Archer, well, uh, I think we're a little bit over time, but I want to thank you both to Gonzalo and Sebastian. Thank you for your time. And if take a look at the website, spectrocloud.com, let us know if you guys have any questions. Um, we'll put information for Gonzalo and Sebastian if people have some direct questions for them. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gonzalo and Sebastian. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bye, guys. guys.